Has anyone in the room here done Resume before? So about a third, okay. How many people are interested in doing Resume? Not as many, okay. Um, so again, I think you know, the part of the session here, when, when, how, and the idea, you know, some of the pearls of water vapor uh, therapy, you'll see that on some of the, uh, of our guidelines that does not say resume, but the only therapy, the only technology that has water vapor for uh, BPH is that. So what's unique about resume here is we're capturing energy, right? Because at the end of the day, we're delivering an energy to a focal zone of the prostate, the transition which is bound, boundaried by the internal capsule. And we have that luxury of using convection so that rather than the old school days of laser where there's con, uh, con, uh, conduction, you get a, you know, a, asymmetric energy delivery throughout the prostate. Now we're able to deliver steam interstitially and just deposit enough energy over 70 degrees Celsius to initiate cell death. Doesn't happen right away, but it takes like, some time, but you can do a much more uh, composite uh, homogeneous delivery of that steam throughout the anatomy with the idea that you're in a contained space. So it's a very short learning curve, unlike you know, uh, some of the other uh, techniques, especially you know, if we consider Eurolift, everyone here in the room that does Eurolift, everyone will do a different technique, number of sutures, different angle, how much torsion, traction. So it's very surgeon specific. Resume is very surgeon agnostic. You just got to click a button, it injects the steam. The only thing that may differ is the number of treatments one would do versus the other, but you have up to 15 treatments and some people get a little trigger happy and over treat. But nonetheless, I don't think there's anything else aside from the gun itself, a single purchase, you don't need a special set of equipment. Um, so there's your generator, that's your one fixed cost, which in Canada was 35K. And the handpiece, again, every, every market will be different, but a fixed price, it's a single use per surgeon. I guess some parts of the world, technically, you can keep it plugged in and do five treatments on one person, five another, but it's a single-use treatment. Um, there you go. So you're delivering that steam every one centimeter, and that steam passes between the cells. You won't get that initial uh, necrosis. There's been no reported abscesses, but you're going to get those overlying one by two centimeter thermal defects, which over time will shrink, absorb, and you'll be able to reduce the prostate about 30%. It's the only miss, the only miss that shrinks the prostate. You actually shrink the prostate. The others, you'll manage their LUTs. This actually treats BPH. So there's a big difference between resume and the others. So you're creating thermal lesions, and you want to overlap. So this is a bit of the skill set, the learning curve, which isn't that hard. Um, you know, kind of when I do my ultrasounds for my periprosthetic block, I take that opportunity and measure that length. Or you can do it during your cysto as you do the pullback, every centimeter is what you want to treat. Um, some people use the idea that if it's a 30 gram, or sorry, you're not really doing resumes on 30 grams, but a 70 gram prostate, you'll do between seven or eight treatments. So one treatment per side. So if you really want to get technical and sound really fancy, it's 0.42 milliliters of, of steam that's injected. That's 208 calories. So next time you're on a treadmill, you can figure out <laughs> per treatment how many, uh, how, what kind of distance you get for that. And you can treat up to 15 nine-second treatments. So in Canada, when we get these really big prostates during COVID, you want to over-treat past 15. Well, you can clock out at eight seconds. It'll make a weird beep, but it won't count as a treatment. So again, if you are looking for those really, really big prostates and you don't want to use your one and only uh, gun and you want to go beyond that, I'm not sure if this is news to people, but you, you can do that. Canadian tricks. So, you know, does this really work? And so the first in man MRI studies were done where they injected these steam th thermal lesions. You can pick them up on MRI. You can see that on the right there. And over the next three to six months, you completely absorb those. And if you calculate what that was in that small group of 10 men, you can see about a, at six months, a 30% reduction in prostate volume. So did that hold true? We, we, we actually, in, uh, Dean, Bilal, and I, myself and a few others, we kind of looked at 12-month data doing trusses on patients who've had resume, and there it was, about a 34% reduction in volume. Again, the only mist that actually treats and shrinks prostates. Um, and regardless of how many treatments we kind of got into, and, and Bilal's probably talk about it as well, less is more, you know, the idea that we were over-treating, if we were really gonna be aggressive, do we really shrink the prostate more? And the answer is no. Uh, not much difference. It was more on the reduction of volume was more correlate with the IPSS reductions. And here are some views of what to expect uh, in the first two months. The key, the key thing here is that you are making a defect. Look at that down a capsule, but there's still some inflammation. It doesn't happen. It doesn't heal up always, uh, you know, as quick as we want. And these are some videos uh, I've seen from patients. This was from uh, Riho uh, out of Sa Cal um, in Spain, looking at one of his patients at six months. So there is a defect, you're down a capsule, and you can see the varimontanum is intact.
but there is an inflammatory response. And everyone may, everyone's gonna have a different response. So that, you can't guarantee that on every person. I'm sure some of us have done resume here in the room and you go back and you look and not much has been done. Or you go back and there's a big sloughing ball of tissue. Just like everyone here operates on a patient, we are traumatic, we're trauma surgeons. We tr to the body, we've created trauma. How that person sloughs, heals, and uh, will respond will be different. So again, my dream of one day maybe biologically look at MRI data or maybe what's going on biologically with the patient may predict how they're gonna do. We're not great, you know. And so, and same thing in prostate cancer, one of our guidelines in Canada is we're supposed to give treatment to those who are gonna have 10 year survival. <laughs> So that one's easy, but how do you do that? But we kind of laugh and we all just, we say we do that, part of our shared decision, but that's what we do. Uh, so looking at five-year data, so there, you know, people ask, how long is this gonna last for? Well, we have five-year data and it looks pretty good. Uh, here it is. Uh, what's impressive is this is a very short procedure. For you and me in, the off, like in an office setting, you can do this between patients. So to me, it's an office-based procedure. As in Canada, we don't have that CPT, it's gonna be done in ASC and so forth, which truly an office-based procedure. We'll put the patient in the room, we'll do a periprosthetic block, or we have penthrox and a few other things we'll talk about. And then I'll go see another patient, wait 10, 15 minutes, come back and do my treatment, which in average is about five minutes. And from that point on, the number of injections can vary based on prostate volume. And there's the data, look at that, IPSS. So we're only treating LUTs, and there's an improvement, but you know, the key thing I like to show everyone is that you're gonna see the results not right away. You know, this is the Amazon later, not an Amazon now treatment. So there is that first month of, uh, you know, discomfort, irritation, and some people may question why they did the procedure during that month. I tell patients that, and I think that's part of expectations. But let's check that out in terms on the right side, if I go back, sorry, the previous, that you also make a significant improvement in the IPSS, in the QMAX. With the, uh, the ITIN and the Urolift, you may only see an increase in of flow rates, uh, marginally maybe a three or four points. So in terms of flow rates and perhaps the trucer function, I'm not sure you know, the others have the same degree of uh, tissue outlet obstruction, because you don't get that defect that we see. Well, how about sexual function? There's been no really de novo impact on erectile function, but it's important to say that it's very low, but there is some patients, about five, 10% of patients I tell them, that they may have impact on their ejaculation. Very important. And technically, when I'm doing those patients who really want to preserve uh, the, the, uh, the ejaculation, when I do those last few apical, I'll see the vera montanum, I'll protrude back in another centimeter and make sure I treat above three and nine o'clock, more anterior. So those, just like aquablation, you want to preserve those areas that the steam can go down and propagate and potentially injure or have a defect of the ejaculatory duct. So key things here, adverse events, you know, it's expected dysuria, they'll have, some patients will have catheters, that's a downside to this, it's not an Amazon now and you pee great, you're gonna have a catheter for at least a week. Some patients in retention two to three weeks, I'll leave it in. Uh, so it's really important to have that discussion with the patient. So in the studies that were the first in man and the clinical trials from have been varied, it's a three day removal, but a third of patients had to come back. And one study that we're trying to do now, we're just gonna look at prospectively for the next year, Every 30 days after we do a resume, what's, how many phone calls do we get? So again, we all know, we don't talk about it, but there, there is a lot more that I think you'd see with the other treatments. So you have to have the staff ready. But the data's there to support durability. Um, you know, the, 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 about 4% of patients will be retreated surgically, and those about a 10% chance you'll have to go back on medications uh, in those patients. What's great about this, as I said, it's a Swiss Army knife. You can treat any size prostate, even beyond 80 grams. I'll discuss some of the results for that later. It's off the label. But nonetheless, you can treat middle, middle lobes, and I think that's well established. So typically, you'll find the sulcuses. The video here doesn't play, but ultimately, you want to get in there. And I usually treat that at the end of treatment, uh, after doing the lateral lobes, coming back and injecting one or two treatments, depending on the size, in the sulcuses of the prostate at the medial lobe. And here's the defect, so you can see the same patient here as we retract, there's that middle lobe, uh, a marked difference. And I think those are the patients who really do well. Guys in retention during COVID, we had a good results with, and those with medial lobes tend to do very well. Here's the cocktail we have, so aside from, I guess you're kind of forced in the States to do this at an ASC for reimbursement purposes, but in Canada we can do this in the office, and I can usually do this under a periprosthetic block using a transrectal ultrasound probe, so I'm very familiar with this. There's penthrox, sort of the green whistle. Uh, you can use this, uh, it's self-administered to the patient. Uh, you don't need much uh, aside from dantrolene, just in the rare case of uh, malignant hyperthermia. 
but it's one of those things that, you know, as you're all just, we, we, we learn about, we don't really deal with, but something to think about if you have it. Uh, and the Shailen catheter, which I think is really cool, it's in Europe. Uh, um, I'll show you a little image after. It's an intraurethral block, which I think has a lot of potential uh, for all of these myths. So I'm hoping someone can distribute it here in the US because it's freaking cool. And you heard it from me first, so I'll show that to you. So here's some of the tricks in terms of you know, the periprosodic block, even with my POCUS. So days where the big ultrasound is down, I've actually used that Clarius ultrasound uh, transrectal probe to do my uh, periprosodic blocks with good imaging. And my neck scrape, because you can see on the far right corner, I've got the ultrasound in there. I'm doing all my freezing right there on the phone, and I can capture cool videos too. So usually put 20 cc's, five at the seminal vesicles, five at the apex, and do that bilaterally. So four punctures uh, to get that anesthesia. Here's the Shalin catheter. It looks like a three-way catheter, but you just advance. You can see on the white with the yellow whistle there, you advance, uh, sorry, just below, you can see the needle under the uh, balloon. So the yellow port's the balloon. You inject that, and it's, you freely rotate it like a clock, and you pick the an angle you want to do, and top right, you can see you want to put in about five cc's at three o'clock, then at uh, 11 o'clock, then at uh, 8 and 4 o'clock. And you do those all intraurethrally, and we did a study in that, that only. So you don't need to do a transrectal, you don't do a tra transfecal, what some people say. You don't, you know, the patients did really well. Then we put in our intraurethral gel and did the resume, and we had actually the lowest VAS scores during the treatment. Uh, so again, we did a small series of 10. Uh, we'd like to see that come on board, because I really think that intraurethral, you can inject not only lidocaine, you can put in some steroid if you want to. You can do a lot of things with it, maybe some antibiotics. You, a lot of ideas that we can have. But the idea that we're injecting lidocaine locally into the transition zone where we want to put the energy kind of makes sense. I think everyone would agree that makes sense. But so this is called the Shalin catheter. They're out of Sweden. Um, that something just to think about and hopefully we'll see soon. So tips and trips, you know, don't be intimidated. You can do middle lobes. Uh, you can do larger prostates. Uh, we'll get into some of the data quickly here. Tricks for those, again, for every one centimeter. So when I do my periprosthetic block, I'm measuring the length X, Y, and Z in that Z length axis. If it's six centimeters, I'll probably do six per side. And if it's a middle lobe, I'll add two more. So that's kind of what your mental plan is, making uh, that uh, adjustment. And the other question, do you do one lobe, but then go back and do the other? I've had more of the experience that as I'm pulling back, I'll do one, rotate other, pull back, one, one. And so most of my treatments will be pulling back the scope versus going in and out, which then stirs up some funky bleeding and makes you unhappy. Uh, so over 80 grams, there's a, we're, hoping, we're hoping to see the resume Excel study, but that never really uh, came to fruition. So we decided to do it ourselves. So Dean and I, during COVID, had a great experience. Bill Al, as well as part of the study, we did, you can see up to 104 grams. Six, uh, two thirds had a middle lobe. And they, again, the treatment time, under 10 minutes, the number of injections, you can see up to 13. Kept the catheter about two weeks. And again, the improvements very matching what we saw, the 20 something plus IPSS is dropping a single score. And not just that, just the, uh, the flow rate as well improving uh, by 55%. And then Kevin, very just uh, impressed right now looking at sort of what else is out there, not just the Zorn and all experience, but you know, multi-center experience of these large prostates. So again, we'll, we see in the guidelines, hopefully one day, but right now, off-label, I'm sure those in the room here who do resume, uh, I would not shy away from treating oversized prostates as well. Uh, and again, the key thing, try to avoid over-treatment. I think to follow the one centimeter rule is gonna be uh, great, and Bilal uh, helped push the envelope with the less is more, showing that if you do one or two treatments per side, you also had equally good results. So just kind of jumping ahead here for the, this is men in retention. During COVID, it was great. We had, uh, especially with patients waiting on a wait list for surgeries in Canada, uh, some opportunities for that. And it does work, but you can keep the catheter for a little bit longer. So key things here, it's a one-time treatment. It's light sedation, really, uh, you know, I wouldn't say no pain, low, low pain. Most people, VAS between two and three. And you're using water. You're not injecting any other foreign object. Um, low, but not zero ejaculatory dysfunction. And I think you know, making sure you and your team are ready for the next few weeks of hand holding with some of the anti-inflammatory. Um, so again, just jumping ahead here for time standpoint. Again, it's an efficacious. It's well studied, well proven. It's really the only missed procedure that actually treats BPH. You can actually shrink prostates by about a third. You won't get the uh, the Amy Cranbach, uh, you know, 85% reduction in full cure of BPH. But I think you can get patients off medications uh, and help them achieve their goals with the integrated ejaculation and, uh, you know, no, not, no incontinence um, uh, or, uh, ejaculatory, or low ejaculatory dysfunction. So nonetheless, I think uh, resume is something to consider for your, uh, your practice. And um, we'll answer any questions later.